is measured or climate is measured in 30 year cycles. And since the 1800s, humans have contributed to the release of, garb of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the air, which is what is driving our current state of climate change. This figure came from an IPCC report that came out a couple years ago, the 1.5 degree report that really kind of shook things up a lot on the media about how we are not um, hitting or, or basically how quickly climate change is accelerating. And you can see that at the end of the graph with that nice trajectory. Um, which can be very high or you know has some lower angles depending on where we do and what our actions are over the next few years um so moving forward there's a little bit of a video just to show that and hopefully we can get that working for you fabulous i don't think that one needs sound yep so um here this is looking at about well, from the 1800s. Um, so this is looking at over the course of the last 130 years or so. And you can see this is a temperature anomaly graph. So this isn't um, the number, this is looking at the difference in degrees from the average temperature over um, the course of, well, this entire period. So, um, so what you're seeing here is an increased rise throughout um, and Paul has kindly linked the video in the chat if you wanted to see more of that and what you will notice is at the top even though we're talking um, globally right now we've only actually had a temperature rise of about 0.83 degrees celsius since the industrial revolution which isn't very much but as you probably saw in this video that obviously um, that's had a different effect across different parts of the world. So up in the Arctic, you have much warmer and you can see with the red across the top that the temperature actually went up much higher in those regions compared to more temperate and um, equatorial regions. So up in the Arctic now, they've seen temperature rises as high as nine or 12 degrees Celsius, which was practically unheard of beforehand. Um, Abby, did you have anything to add about like obviously that's like the global average so there's areas in the arctic that are actually warm it, warming 10 degrees uh, sorry not 10 degrees 10 times um faster um than anywhere else on the planet um so when often people think of the equatorial regions as the warming uh the fastest warming places but actually because of the processes which we'll go into later um of like warming in the arctic regions um and melting sea ice is actually warming a lot quicker and having like massive effects on biodiversity and climate local weather Great, thank you. And just to um, move forward into some of the mechanisms behind that, um, let's see if we can get that slide to switch. Perfect. Um, and the reason, oh, there it is, is basically, um, you know, something very simple that you might have remembered learning about greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect um, back in primary school. And essentially sunlight that goes through our atmosphere warms our planet. And when it bounces back in the form of infrared heat, molecules like carbon dioxide and um, methane aren't allowed to escape. So they bounce back and they create this warmer earth. And there are six major greenhouse gases. There's carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, methane, sorry, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, sulfate hydroxide, and nitrogen trifluoride. Um, and they're a problem because some can live in our atmosphere for tens and hundreds and thousands of years even. Um, carbon dioxide is the big one that we talk about, but in actual, well, in reality, methane and other gases actually can be much more potent and have a bigger heating effect than carbon dioxide, but we use carbon dioxide as a kind of measure to allow us to assess, okay, how much, how, how bad is something? It's kind of like our baseline to measure against. And this information that we have um, and the, the kind of, you know, we showed a graph of, Abby, if you can move to the next one, of 180 years. Um, well, there's actually thousands of years of climate history by looking through ice, um, you know, the ice core samples and, and looking at, um, you know, history of, of fossils and things like this to determine how, how long um, this has been. So here you can see this is for the last thousand years oh, and, you get, and you see that climb. And then if you um, see the next graph, Abby, then you'll see that there's actually hundreds of thousands of years of data. Um, this takes you back 
800,000 years. And um, this is again looking at core samples. And this shows you that, in, in fact, yes, climate change is natural. And you hear that often as an argument about, well, climate change isn't a problem because it's, it's natural. And you're totally right. And people are right if you look at those levels. Um, but then when you see that end bit where you have the 1950 level and the current level, that increase, that sharp, 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 steep hill has never really been approached before in such a manner in all of this history. And that's where we're seeing a problem. Um, and, and obviously that's where, you know, people get confused. So moving forward, you know, we think about why people um, don't believe in climate change. Um, Abby, can you move forward a slide, please? Thank you. Um, say, if you look at the graph, like oh, yeah, it, we should be entering like an ice age relatively soon, like obviously in like geological time period. Um, yeah. And an ice age is nowhere on the horizon. So when people say, you know, this is a natural warming period, there's no there's no coming back down from this at the moment. So. Exactly. Very well pointed out. And um, yes. And what you can see here is obviously that there's a lot of mixed messages from the media, um, which which contributes a lot to people's confusion. You know, here we have this Times report of be worried, be very worried. And then this other report that talks about how, well, luxury cruise liners are allowed to go through the Arctic now. Isn't that fantastic? And so people don't really, you know, it's easy to get confused. And I think um, there's just a couple more examples of media on the next slide, you know, scientists say we're going to pass two degrees, the UN climate report says we're all doomed, um, global warming is likely to breach two, what, two degrees Celsius. So, you know, the, the media approaches it in multiple ways, but um, at the end of the day, we hope that they're covering the right things, which is that, that indeed all these startling F-bombs, as they're declaring it, um, uh, about the real status of climate change. Um, I particularly like the next example, which is to say that um, climate change is helping Africa because greenhouse gases are bringing rain to areas that have suffered droughts for decades, states, says a new study. And there is a truth to this, that in some cases, climate change could be beneficial to certain areas and certain crops and certain um, ways of life. So there, there definitely is that dynamic or that possibility. Um, but when you look at the big picture of what's happening, this positive reaction is probably one tiny thing in an onslaught of many negative things. And we'll look a little bit more about um, soil and irrigation and, and, and the effect on the earth um, a little later on. So even though it does seem confusing, the main point is, um, just next slide, that 97% of climate change scientists agree not only that climate change is real, but that climate warming trends over the past century are extremely likely due to human activities. And, and it really is at this point much more undisputed than that, I would say. Um, there is a lot of kickback from um, the oil industry and, and other um, industries about about climate change and trying to you know find research and ways to kind of twist twist anything to um, make it seem like climate change isn't as big of a deal or like that media report that it benefits people in some way but the fact is that's not the truth that's not the case um, so just let's do a little check-in. Is anyone feeling any better or worse about climate change? I know we all started with mid-range, but if anyone wants to um, just share in the chat how we're feeling, remember a um, five is the worst, still five, same five. Everyone's feeling fairly similar right now, which is, which is good. Um, and maybe on the next slide, there's a um, slight like um, there's a joke about climate change, which, you know, isn't very often heard, but um, anyway, so let's move on to talk about why the climate is changing. Um, and this is really down to the natural gases, methane and um, the six gases that we talked about in, in the um, discussion. And you can see here, this is from 1960. So this is actual recorded data from Hawaii. Um, and this is one of the main sites where we look at carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, so you can see that it's very stable rise from 1960 to 2020. Um, and then if we click to the next image, you can see again that um, there's even more specific that there are fluctuations. So 2015, 2016, 
um, every year, you know, there's the seasonal fluctuation of winter and summer. There are a day and night fluctuations, even just between night and cold, light and dark. Um, and then there are longer fluctuations, um, you know, throughout the season. So, but as we can see here, the trend is overall rising, just like those graphs we showed earlier. This is more detailed image of that. And the reasons behind this, um, are really down to people and this human induced climate change as we're calling it. Um, so moving on to the next slide, how are humans played our parts? And that really comes down to our behaviors and our change and what we're doing. Um, can everyone see the next slide? Can you um, add to that as well? Like yeah. the client, the, there's a huge time lag in what we, um, in like climate in like what we feel now happened years and years ago so actually the um, emissions that we're producing now we won't feel the effects of until like the next 50 years so there's a huge time lag so actually um, some warming scenarios aren't as pr projected as high as scientists actually think they are going to be um, and that's because of different like feedback loops which I think we're going to get back to later. Yes, thank you, Abby. And that's exactly why when this article came out a couple of years ago, the 1.5 report um, that said we have 12 years left to, to change, you know, to really make a difference in climate change. It's not because it was going to say in 12 years, we're going to, you know, it's going to be doomsday, but it's to say if we don't start making the actions now, the repercussions later on down the line are going to be so much more worse than we can imagine. And, um, and we see that with how humans have played their part. So here's looking from this big report um, that was kind of signed off by 11,000 scientists that came out last year about profoundly troubling signs. Um, and, you know, there's connections between world population, but more importantly, there are things like air transport, which you look at the billions of passengers um, per day and then also, or per year, sorry, and then also meat production. So the kilograms per person per year um, and those things have just been on the rise. And when you can imagine the um, two graphs we showed in the previous image, the trends, that kind of angle is very similar. And you can almost see that one can, you know, link to another. Um, and going on to the next slide, you can see how then again, those trends are, as I said, parallel to the um, effects that we're seeing around the planet. So the carbon dioxide rise, the methane rise, temperature rising, sea level change, extreme weather, and the melting of the Greenland ice, which obviously has a reverse graph because it's going, it's getting much smaller. Um, and that again is, as Abby's mentioned, kind of plays into the feedback loops. As we see things rising, um, such as methane and carbon dioxide, and we see the climate is warming, we're losing ice. And the reason ice is so important is because it has um, the ability to reflect sunlight back and to create um, to help cool our earth overall. And the more it melts, the less physical space there is for the ice to reflect back. And therefore we just keep seeing this warming cycle. So, as well, like every, they, they have such a big, they take so much carbon dioxide and warmth out of the atmosphere, but as they warm, it gradually becomes layered and stratified. So actually there's a, there's a small layer at the top that can now take in carbon dioxide and heat, but actually the rest of the kind of ocean is now like you know, irrelevant to taking in this um, the carbon dioxide and heat because we've stratified it. So it's just a complete feedback loop. Yeah, exactly. And there are lots of these feedback loops and they have a very, well, negative effect on our planet. So um, we're just going to explore some of the regions and the habitats that are being affected by um, climate change and the first is obviously our jungles and our rainforests and in the last four decades we've lost pristine lowland jungle about 75 percent decline um, and then we have um, a loss of 15 million hectare acres hectares yearly um, which is the tropical forest and that again leads to a lot of diversity loss because of all the animals and critters in there and most importantly um, to us in a way is that jungles store and capture more carbon than any other land habitat so if we lose these forests which are full of trees that are soaking in all the carbon dioxide and all these greenhouse gases that are warming the planet then we're just aiding again here's another loop we're aiding the process of these gases staying in the habit in our atmosphere for longer um, so the the idea is that we need more plants, you hear this all the time, to help soak up all the carbon dioxide and by destroying our forests we are obviously um, making that very difficult and 
back to thinking about how this affects people, um, is that these trees and these forests cool the planet and provide food and medicine for over a billion people. So, um, you know, an eighth of our population is dependent on rainforests and um, or natural forests and, and destroying them puts their lives and livelihoods at risk. Um, moving forward a little bit into forest, um, just deforestation, here's a really good and terrible example at the same time. Um, this island on the left is Borneo, which is part of Indonesia. And, um, and as you can see, this was the, the green um, from 1950s, is obviously the forest cover. And by 2020, this is essentially what it looks like. And most of this has been cut down for palm plantations and farming and agricultural land. Um, so this has just been a really detrimental part of the environment. Um, and so that's been um, something that that you know we see happening all the time. And I think the next slide is a little video just showing um, the extent of destruction and kind of deforestation. Um, and Paul just linked that video if anyone wanted to watch it again. Um, and a very kind of somber and sad, you know, take on the deforestation that we're seeing. Um, and you saw with Madagascar how it turned from green around the river and where we've utilized with technology and farming. Um, we've absorbed all the, you know, we're utilizing all the water and resources and, and therefore the forest kind of dried out and it became this very dry um, arid land. And places like Madagascar where the species are endemic, they're local only to the area like the lemurs, um, that they're really at risk and in trouble because there's no other home for them and there, there are no other you know, areas where lemurs are living um, among other hundreds of other species. So losing an area like that is um, really vital to to our biodiversity or very, you know, it's a very tragic thing. Um, so moving on to look at our oceans, um, which is obviously one of the biggest things that we talk about in terms of global warming and climate warming. Um, let's see if we can just, sorry, the slide is changing. Back to the last point is um, I quite often hear people um, say, um, you know, um, who like oh well who cares about you know the lima in madagascar but actually like when people think of things like deforestation people forget that actually ecosystem degradation in itself so just you know it not being as productive as it could be has an impact on all those species and every species in an ecosystem has its role so you know the loss of the lima has its role in that ecosystem which will then have a tr like a cascade effect down through all of the other levels in that ecosystem to uh, lead to ecosystem degradation which then leads to a whole host of other impacts so you have to think of it like every animal has its place definitely and and people are just like that you know we all have our place but i guess we've uh, taken up a bigger space than than we should be in, in a lot of ways but um, exactly, there is a trigger effect because all the animals, again, if you think back to primary school when you learn about the food web and, you know, when an animal is taken out of that, it shifts everything and it causes this, um, this knock-on effect. So looking at our oceans, um, which are so important to us because 50% of our breathable oxygen actually comes from the oceans. It comes from the phytoplankton and the, the, um, the plants, oceanic plants, essentially, that are also um, processing carbon dioxide and, and providing us with oxygen. And in this case, more than 3 billion people depend on oceans as their primary food source. So it's a huge, it's almost half the world's population is dependent on the oceans. Um, and they've been absorbing our carbon dioxide and emissions for so many years. Um, they've absorbed more than 30% of it has gone into the oceans and 90% of the excess heat energy since the 1990s. So the oceans have been rising terribly. And with that, you see what's called coral bleaching. So on the left picture is obviously this lovely, lively coral reef. And on the right hand side is this white reef, which um, at this point, it's, it's very shallow. So it looks almost like it's poking out of the water in some bits, which can happen depending on tides. And that's not a natural and, and a reef could survive that. But mass bleaching events, which happen when the coral, the waters get too hot, um, then they, the corals will eject their colorful um, zooplankton. It's a small little animal that they, they live with. They're symbiotic um, and they're algae. They have an algae that, they live, that lives inside them and provides them with color. And so essentially when it gets too hot, they get stressed and they kick out their colorful 
um, algae and and they often don't reply to this so or they don't um, survive come and come back from it um, so ocean acidity has also been rising and it's been increasing about 26 percent since the start of the industrial revolution which makes it very hard for things like corals and that have hard shells like um, snails and clams and bivalves and all those you know lovely crustaceans that people love to eat and these animals are struggling to um, develop shells that are hard enough because of the acidity um, and around 85 percent of the fish stock are overexploited. so we have really really used technology to massively um, exploit our oceans and a recent study that came out um, said and another one from the ipcc predicted that 1 billion people will be at risk of 2050 by 2050 of rising waters um, and that's both oceanic water um, and so those are all the people who live on the coast essentially who the rising the water as it's um, rises for two reasons it's rising because of the melting ice but also because as the ocean warms the the molecules space out more and warmer water takes up more space so um, it's something we don't often consider but the warming effect will actually make the water in a way bigger and therefore rising more um and so to summarize that with the next slide um the global temperature rise of 1.5 degrees celsius coral reefs will decline 70 to 90 percent and that's by the end of the century um and at two degrees the predicted coral loss is 99 percent um and right now our trajectory is currently about three to four degrees celsius so this is pretty detrimental and and a very serious thing for our oceans and all the animals and people that depend on them um and more than 90 percent of corals are now expected to die off by 2050 um so that's pretty terrifying but on a positive spin um, they've discovered these corals that live in um, the Middle East, um, in the Red Sea and such, that are much more hardy to warm temperature because obviously they've been surviving in an almost desert climate for so long. And scientists are now beginning to research how they could use those techniques or those coral genetics to um, help other coral species thrive and survive or to help build coral reefs in other areas as temperatures warm. So there's some really interesting and positive research going on there because I know thinking about our oceans um, being destroyed is, is quite terrifying. Um, and so moving on to earth soil and farming. Abby, do you want to cover this one? Yeah, sure. Um, I just a point to um, actually add to this slide is that um, yeah. right back to the right back in the beginning when um, Stav said about um, you know in certain places um, global cha um, global warming actually can have some positive effects. So some people have argued that across like East Africa and places um, in maybe some areas in the Middle East have experienced more rainfall, but actually. Um, this year so related to earth soil and farming um you would have seen on the news probably about the huge swarms of locusts like flooding into these countries and basically destroying their crops and it's left many many communities without anything to eat um so this has happened across um the horn of africa like kenya somalia ethiopia but it's also been seen across the middle east and yemen and saudi arabia sudan you get and then of, again in like africa and uganda but quite often these issues then create like serious food insecurity pressures. So then that leads to conflict and war. So actually, although sometimes it may look beneficial that places, you know, experience mean more rainfall, for instance, um, and you can be like, oh great, you know, they have more drinking water. There's so many other side effects to the to changing weather and climate patterns that you may not have thought about. Um, but yeah, sorry, back to you, Steph. <laughs> no, no, that's fine um that's really useful also because it really has such a relevant context to everyone's lives in a sense and we've seen i think you know a lot of people have come become a little bit more aware of our food production and kind of dependency on food abroad after covid because you know with everyone kind of panic buying and, and shops running out of certain things you kind of were maybe you know maybe you think twice to go oh that's funny i didn't think about where this came from or how long or how far the production line is that it takes a while to come back if, if we were to run out of stock and you can imagine that in places um like abby was talking about that that food production is is really um localized and very you know sensitive um so it's really hard to um 
envision a world where this becomes a bigger problem. And essentially, um, as we saw with Madagascar and, you know, the soil changes and land changes, is that all of the um, kind of behaviors that we're doing um, with farming and, and industrial farming and, and chemicals that we use um, are going to be really, you know, detrimental to our our soils and the overuse of pesticides and fertilizers is contributing to the loss of fertile soil. Um, and they show by 2080 that we think there will be complete deterioration and, and growing almost anything except for um, a couple of monocultures that have been you know, genetically modified to survive is going to be nearly impossible. Um, and so you see this here with the predictions for how much corn is going to be um, how much less corn is going to be created. I think that's by the thousands of kilograms or millions, um, uh, you know, there's a huge decline in the different resources that we will need um, throughout to, to survive, essentially. And um, I had some experience living and working in the Philippines where talking to the farmers, they said that they used to get two or three seasons a year, they'd be able to yield two or three harvests a year. Um, but because the rain has shifted and their climates are changing or their weather patterns are changing, that it's in for several years now, they're only getting one or two, which actually means that they have to import rice in to feed their communities, which um, was something they never had to do before. So these things are going to have detrimental effects. And the next slide now shows just a bit of a map of um, predicted adverse impacts on crop yields due to climate change. So this is at three degrees warmer, which technically is where we're heading if we don't, if we don't take further climate action. And um, the change in yields are in the red. So if they're having a negative change and the positive change is in the green. So like Abby mentioned, there are gonna be places that see these benefits and see more rain and see more, more yield um, of crop, but then you see the amount of places that are in red and you realize how many of them and how many millions of people um, or billions of people are depending on those areas and are going to be suffering because they cannot um, grow their crops like they used to. And so this is a really big problem that we have to kind of think ahead and think about in terms of our farming and and how we um, how we utilize our land and, and how we can eat and harvest food more sustainably. Um, so just moving on to thinking about, again, land use. Um, Abby, I'm going to let you cover this slide. Um, following on what Stav said as well, um, for like de deforestation and things, um, it actually obviously our soils, the health of our soils rely on plants and vegetation and trees especially. So by getting by like getting rid of the um, getting rid of like plant biodiversity and basically replacing it with monoculture, you're destroying the soils, which are the foundations for food production, for life, for biodiversity. So we are having massive impacts, whether it's direct or indirect on the whole ecosystem. Um, but I've just included these um, uh, like graphics here. Um, I don't know if any of you recently saw David Attenborough's A Life on Our Planet, but I was pretty shocked um, when he showed the graph of the humans and livestock ratio to wild animals. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you, maybe some of you have read the recent UN report um, that reported that there's been a decline of six, there's a, a biodiversity decline of 68% in the, in the last 50 years. Um, so these graphs just show um, the tiny 4% of wild mammals there are now left on the planet. So, you know, when you go abroad and you're like, wow, I saw, I don't know if you've been to Africa, like all these zebras and wildebeest and the masses, they're this tiny dent in our, like, you know, animal kingdom now because we've basically taken over. Um, and also this um, specifically to do with birds as well, I thought was really interesting. 70% of our, the birds on this planet are now chicken and poultry which I just thought was a huge number a huge number when you think of all the little sparrows that live in your head like that's just that's just crazy um but also um in 2010 um there was um I don't know if you've heard of the Aichi biodiversity targets that were set um and they basically sent 20 sets 20 objectives to kind of um it was going to be called from 2010 2010 to 2020 the decade of biodiversity where we were going to like you know like tackle this issue, bring biodiversity back, um, but we have not met any of the targets. They say that some, some targets have been met slightly, but not the whole target. And also in kind of a, um, you know, rush to achieve them, things like um, biodiversity target 11 um, was to establish a certain amount of protected areas. So in a rush to kind of achieve these targets, we've actually kind of 
uh, undermined social and environmental systems that have been in place in certain areas. So we've actually caused huge uh, inequalities, especially in social systems of local communities. Um, and if you haven't got local communities on board, you know, protecting these animals and using their traditional knowledge, then biodiversity isn't isn't going to thrive. Um, so we need to readdress these targets and make 2020 to 2030 the decade on biodiversity. Yeah, fantastic. Um, do you want to go and talk about ice, Abby, as well? Because ice was uh, one of Abby's specialties um, <laughs> during, yeah. during our master's. I love ice. <laughs> um, no, so yeah, when I did my master's, I did my project on the Arctic. Um, but um, yeah, no, sea ice is just, it's, it's, just mel it's melting at ridiculous rates. Um, and it's through huge feedback loops. So obviously as the ocean warm, more sea ice melts, uh, the more sea ice melts, there's a, the albedo effect. So the ice actually reflects the um, warmth back into the atmosphere, um, the reflection of the sun back into the atmosphere, but with no ice, it's just warming up the oceans. Um, and that's having also huge effects on Arctic species. Um, through habitat loss um, and the spread of between populations. So if you take um, polar bear populations, for example, there's normally two types in, in different areas, but there's like a resident species that will stay local to a certain area. And then there's the more mobile like population that will go up into the Arctic on the ice and then come back down. Um, but these populations interbreed. So there's a lot of genetic diversity, um, but basically obviously they're being separated. The ones on the ice are the destined not great at the moment unless we do something about it um but we need to basically increase these populations meeting so we can increase genetic um, diversity and keep our ecosystems healthy um but yeah do you want to take air staff <laughs> yeah so um i mean that's something which you know we have a like typical picture of this um polar bear on on the melting ice and um that's why in sort of this cartoon because i don't know if you can see that he's fanning himself with the paris agreement it's a bit of a joke on the paris agreement because there's a lot of criticism about whether it's active and whether it's actually helping but um we'll talk about that in a second um so yes obviously ice is really important and then air is really important there's a there's a feedback loop again with air pollution and climate change and the warmer um warmer our climate gets the more it exasperates air pollution um, and that's just to do with smog and ozone being heated up through UV so we can see that in London on the really hot days sometimes when it feels like the air is really thick and hard to breathe and, and we see that in pictures like this one um, where people live in kind of a state of smog all year round because of the air pollution and the heat um, and around the world now it kills about seven it says six but actually it's outdated about seven million deaths per year are, are related to air pollution and um, those will only be increasing and, and growing with climate change. So um, climate change affects, you know, habitats and it affects people and it affects the animals that live in them as well um, on multiple levels. And that's, um, that's really um, a problem. So let's just, now that we've kind of summed up our climate change um, feelings and or, you know, research and, and kind of impact, um, how is everyone feeling now? So you don't have to stick to the numbers. You can put in a smiley face or say a phrase or whatever you want to do. Um, but just, yeah, let us know how we're doing. How we're doing. Adrian Smith, you're so positive. I love it. All right, good. So no one's feeling worse. Now let's see if we can help people feel better. <laughs> um, so moving forward, um, to the next slide. And how do we turn climate change into positive change? And it all starts with us. And I know that's kind of hypocritical or, or it seems like, oh, that's the obvious thing. And of course, you're going to say that. Um, well, the fact is that we're facing human induced climate change and human behaviors and attitudes need to shift from every angle in order to change that. Um, so let's start from the big level with our governments. Um, I like to say, is it Next slide. Um, governments in action or government in action? It's a bit of a joke. Um, because obviously we see a lot of talk from our governments and it's hard to always tell if they're actually doing anything productive and, and if we're actually making changes in, in a way that's useful. Um, so we're just going to elaborate on that a little bit. Obviously, there is the Paris Agreement. Um, so that's on the next slide. And the Paris Agreement in three lines is this big old agreement that was um, came together at the Conference of Parties, which is held by the UN. And we're supposed to hold one every year to talk about climate issues. And 
so um, the Paris Agreement was adopted in 2015 and it came into effect actually just this year, which is a lot of things that people don't know about probably. Um, it was signed initially by 183 parties, um, which is essentially a country or a small island state, and now 195 have signed. Um, they couldn't decide between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees, but it was the first time that they ever had a global agreement that included the degrees at all and um, that was a really big deal and that was partially because of this alliance of small island states which are essentially small islands like the Maldives or Kirebi which you might have heard of are, are seeing the effects of rising sea levels right now and have been dealing with them already for 10 years or so. Yes, only came into effect this year, Julie. It is quite shocking, I agree. Um, and the idea with the Paris Agreement is that every country had to make their own declaration of how they were going to get to the, the how they were going to help us achieve this 1.5 goal um and so that was kind of controversial because some governments could say well we're going to just do something and they had like a one-page document on oh we're you know reducing energy and blah 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 um and other governments um you know made these huge massive reports about all the single measures that they're doing and unfortunately governments like Australia, I think theirs was only four pages long. The US was also a minimum of two or three pages, maybe five. All, you know, a lot of the big kind of Western countries took a took a kind of shortcut and didn't really go into detail about what they're doing, whereas these small island nations who see climate change day to day um, wrote these epic reports on all the things they're trying to do. But these countries lack resources and um, and time and efficient, you know, money to make these things happen. So um, there wasn't a minimum on ratifications. It was just an agreement then that this is what we were going to do. And if you can see in this chart um, that, you know, we're more about less around one degree Celsius, maybe a little bit under, um, and the Paris Agreement is for 1.5. The pledges and targets as they have them are putting us somewhere in the 2.3 range to 3.7. The current policies are putting us all the way up to 4.3. The domestic, the optimistic one could lower us a little to 2.9 but essentially we've got a long way to go still um, and we see countries like America um, which Abby went to the next slide yeah so Trump has obviously um, pulled out of the Paris Agreement and I think he's supposed to sign the document to that officially pulls us out the day after the election so that will be really interesting on November 4th they're technically not out of it because there's a whole procedure of paperwork um, but the positive side is that that is that despite you know, Trump pulling America out, more than 1400 cities and states and businesses in the US have vowed to stand by it. So even though, you know, the global government is going, well, we don't care about the Paris Agreement, you have all these smaller groups and governments working together to say, actually, we're going to keep fighting this. Um, and that's really good news. And um, okay. we can think about, yeah, go on, Abby. Like um, California, for instance, they are uh, leading the way in like green green technology and renewables and everything and they have such high um uh, like targets for themselves and actually if they were their own nation they'd be the fifth biggest economy in the world like ahead of germany and india so i think when you put it into that sort of perspective there is hope for the us <laughs> yes yeah, I mean, California is amazing. Everyone I know there has little rock gardens now because they realize that um, having lawns is not sustainable. So they've, <laughs> they've moved away from grass. So you just, I mean, it just takes time. But that's an example of how behavior and culture um, can shift and change. So just moving on, there's a question I have for you guys. Um, looking at now the UK and London, how are greenhouse gas emissions are equivalent to which other place? You could just pop this in the chat, um, have a guess. We'll just give you like, 10, 20 seconds to reply. Um, and you're totally right, Rachel. I'm very optimistic about the next election. So hopefully, hopefully we see a comeback. Um, but I'm not really sure. So we see Greece, Greece, New York, Japan, Hong Kong, Panama City. Yeah, so essentially, oh yeah, I'll be gone. I was just going to say, I was pleasant, well, I wasn't pleasantly surprised, I was shocked when I found out this fact. So go on, take it away. <laughs> Absolutely shocked. Um, so London's greenhouse gas emissions are equivalent to actually both either Portugal or Greece. So those two, Portugal or Greece as countries, and you imagine obviously the size of Portugal and Greece are quite different, but obviously depending on pe how people live and, and their behaviours and, and the industry, the 
the greenhouse gas emissions can be quite different. And then, of course, you have London, which is obviously much, much smaller than both of those. And yet our greenhouse gas emissions are huge. Um, and that's obviously, you know, being a city and we take a lot of resources and transportation and deliveries and materials and goods. So, um, you know, but just thinking about city dwellers, as we're most of us are city dwellers, um, that is a good question, Julie, about population of Portugal and Greece. I do not know. Oh, 11 million, someone said. <laughs> so London's population is, um, yeah, about 9 million. Greece is 11. I'm not sure population of Portugal, but so even there, Greece is beating us. So moving forward, the UK has committed to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by at least, at least 100% of 1990, meaning that they could go negative. Uh, there you go from Paul, it's 10 million for Portugal. So London has a smaller population and yet we have more emissions. Um, but again, this would be because of the city. So, um, and so we're, we're targeted to get to 100% um, of 1990 levels to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And the first carbon budgets have been put into legislation and run up to net 2032. So there is some positive change um, going on from the UK. And you can see here in this map, that's like our UK relevant, um, or this image, sorry, warming years. And, we, and I feel like every year, basically, I've been in London two, three summers now. Um, every summer, they say, oh, this is the warmest summer yet. I don't know if this summer was really that warm, but, um, but you did have these heat waves coming through from maybe as early as April until October. So um, we do see these warming events that, that do add up. So there is action going on um, in the government on local levels and smaller levels. And then there's businesses. Um, so here's just a quick, again, question um, to see what can businesses do? So if anyone wants to pop an idea into the chat, um, we'll just give about 30 seconds to hear from, from what's going on. Anyone have any thoughts about what businesses can do to combat climate change. Reducing air travel, making all food vegan, stopping use plastic packaging, locally sourcing, sustainable marketing, encourage governments to enforce stricter laws and regulations, look at the supply chain, educate staff, use green energy, B core status, most should close down. I don't disagree with you, um, Reverend Adrian Smith. Renewable energy, encouraging households to use, to act, getting rid of silly use plastics. So yeah, you guys have lots of fantastic ideas and just moving faster and quicker websites. That's fantastic, Nikki. I, I do um, curious about those. Encouraging local communities to work together. Four day work week, really, I'm totally with you on that one. Uh, less emails, definitely. I don't know if you know this, but every time you do a Google search, it's enough energy to power your light bulb for three minutes, apparently. So if you think about that, when you're searching for everything and working online, it kind of makes you want to um, stay clear of certain things. A4 station, so using Ecosia, that's right. Use Ecosia instead of Google search and they'll plant trees when you search. Um, so moving forward, just to summarize all these fantastic ideas, it's like you guys were in my head. Um, what can businesses do? And you really wrote most of these ideas down um, What's funny is that I had written initially work from home once or twice a week and holding meetings over Skype, which um, was obviously pre-COVID and pre-Zoom era. So um, obviously this has become the norm for a lot of people now. And, and that's um, really, you know, a kind of positive side effect to everything like this. Um, Samuel asked a question, has lockdown had any impact on emissions? Yes, it has. Um, so emissions did go down overall. Well, carbon dioxide did go down quite a lot and um, we saw that, but now looking at air pollution, the levels have actually gone almost back to normal in most major cities. So even though emissions did go down um, a lot, I think overall the like lack of flying and everything was only about two or 3% um, by the end of the year. Abby, I don't know if you know the exact number, I could be wrong, but it is, it's not even in the double digits. Um, so unfortunately it wasn't a huge impact um, and the emissions have gone back to normal because planes are still flying, even though they're flying a lot less, they're, they're, you know, flying 
with more people. People are driving more because they don't want to get on public transport because they're afraid of COVID. Um, there are a lot of reasons. There's also people have been massively shipping and ordering things online since you know this pandemic happened. So there's been a huge increase in in buying things and and just kind of increasing our supply chain um, demand and and transportation of you know ordering things on Amazon, Amazon and ASOS, ASOS and all those companies that are mega online companies have hugely benefited during lockdown and they are contributing a lot of emissions. Um, so if you're interested in that, you could come join us at our next event, which is conscious consumerism, because we're going to dissect all these kind of things that we buy and their life cycles and how they contribute to emissions. Um, but we'll just hurry along here because I know we're short on time and we want to get through um, a few more slides. So moving on, like you guys had all these great business ideas, businesses could become a B Corps, they could become, um, donate to, you know, positive changes. 10 million for the planet was the um, Patagonia's contribution to helping environmental and wildlife initiatives in the US. Um, moving forward, we can get innovative. So um, this was this really cool design. Um, of a funky looking building and it was made of sustainable wood and then the walls and the panel is actually mycelium which is mushroom that grew naturally onto the woods um, and it just created this really abstract and beautiful space um, but it just shows how if we kind of think outside the box or the walls then we could come up with really great ideas so um, yeah this was a featured I don't know what the building is called but I will find it for you Aria and I can share a link after um, and then moving forward again, we can see that our investment in global clean energy has been on the rise. Um, so steadily since 2004, this graph ended at 2018, but I do believe it actually went up the last two years in a row. So that's really exciting. Um, it's the fifth year in a row that it was over the 300 million billion mark, um, which was really fantastic. So what else can we do? What about us? We'll just breeze through this really quickly. Oh yeah, Abby, go on. Um, this energy as well. And like we were just saying about kind of um, the, the emissions in the world um, to do with COVID, um, there was a huge stall in uh, renewable energies. So actually no one was really buying it, no one was producing it, no one was installing it. So we could have probably progressed a lot more with the renewables this year if it hadn't been for COVID. But obviously due to like transportation and product production, there was a stall. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, COVID has, has had a weird effect on things, positive and negative. I just shared the building in the, in the chat so that you guys can see that. So what about us? What can we do? Um, we're going to zoom on ahead, Abby, to, well, we're just going to cover the headlines because we're about out of time. Um, so personal choices to reduce your contribution and we can share these slides with you guys but essentially it boils down to a few things um, eating less meat traveling wiser educating yourself and the people around you if you're part of a business then making sustainable business options and promoting those or talking to the people that can make policies and do that um, and then there are lots of other options so Abby if you want to skip ahead a few slides because I know we're out of time now and we'll just end on a positive note so we'll just go through those and I want to thank everyone for joining us um, sorry that we ran short on time um, but you guys got the gist of it and if you want to come and talk about more of these issues we have this series um, this is the first of six so we'll have lots more um, series events coming up and all of them are related to environmental issues and we'll get into more detail about certain specific ones so you can join us for those and learn more about air pollution plastic pollution um, we'll also be talking about biodiversity loss about um, justice and environmental issues so all these other things one more slide abby and we'll just keep everyone on a positive note there's one more thing that we can show you and um that is encouraging signs so divestment away from fossil fuels has gone up carbon pricing and percent of emissions has gone up fertility rates have gone down um and that's it so thank you guys so much and if you have any questions um we'll stay around for a few more minutes and please post anything in the chat or just um you're free to unmute yourself and say something if you want um abby sally has posted the climathon registration which is going on in november and that is a climate hackathon anyone can join 
you'll get part of a team and help tackle real climate problems. And it's a really amazing um, opportunity. So um, do join. It's really fun and really encouraging and really has like a positive spin on looking at quite a crazy issue. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Abby, Paul, Sally. And um, yeah, we'll just be hanging around. So please do um, feel free to speak.